Oh, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today is a special day. Today you're going to have to endure two lectures, but okay. um, before the class is out, I gotta, I gotta squeeze every little bit we, we can into the remaining time. Um, so today we're going to uh, use lecture time, uh, and some of that will be discussing the Nico answer time. Uh, and then we will further uh, have some additional material on this in this module of object oriented testing object oriented systems and really understanding quality issues with object oriented systems. So um, we'll use the lecture and then we'll use the tutorial. And then finally, the horror will end. Okay. <laughs> well, sort of. Sort of. You, you've got a deadline still coming up. So, um, uh, but but at least the in-person horror will uh, will end for you. Okay. Um, so, uh, we're going to get going with uh, that exercise I asked you to pursue, and as needed, discussion from that exercise. So, I've given you a certain type of problem on this actually because it's a total expansion code. But typically all those problems related to the Liskov substitution principle. A principle for achieving safe subclassing or subtyping rather in the presence of polymorphism, safe polymorphism. Ensuring that subtypes are legitimate behavioral subtypes of, of their supervisor. That they're genuine subtypes. They can be trusted as subtypes of a believer. They don't remember what the Liskov substitution principle basically uh, comes down to. Yes. Uh, sorry? Okay. Super classes can replace subclasses or yeah. you could you could pass an instance of a subclass as if it were the super class, right? Yeah. So in other words, you have an orange, it it is a fruit, and you can pass it around anything that requires a fruit, you can pass an orange. Right? Or you can pass a banana. On that, right? Um, this is this is the general idea, but it's specifically so that's a feature of polymorphism it allows you to to do that. But the Liskov substitution principle gives you guidelines for how to do that safely. And what is that guideline? Can anyone remember it? Yes, well, hi. Anything that's true for a superclass is true for a subclass. Yeah, any property. That you can prove that you can reasonably be counting on for the superclass, or more generally, super type, needs to remain true for each subtype. So if you're counting on a superclass being immutable, if, if you look at a superclass or a super type more generally, it can be just an interface, and you say, you know. Anything with this interface can't be modified. You know, there's no there's no methods to modify it. It's clearly read only. It's clearly immutable. Then any subtype that's passed around as if it were that would similarly need to not be modified in any observable way because someone who well, all they know they think it's an instance of the super type. And they get an instance secretly of the subtype given to them. And their code could be counting on it, not changing. All they know about is a subtype, a supertype. Maybe that was all that existed at the time they wrote their code. And their code is assuming, because it seems clear from the sub from the supertype definition that it can't change. And then suddenly, ba boom, it, it in the subtype, if it changes it. You know, you've got a problem. Their code doesn't work anymore. 
their code could be counting on the, the characteristics of the supertype. And therefore break if those characteristics are not maintained, are not honored, are not respected by the subtype. So any property that's provable but the supertype, the let's go substitution principle says, must also hold true for the subtype for it to be passed, passed around safely as if it were an instance of the supertype. So I give you a couple examples though. I'm hoping to get some dialogue. If you're feeling confused, I wanna I'm gonna talk about this and make sure we can move beyond that. Okay, so here we have a super class, a super type to rule them all, course time. Okay. That's gonna be for all of these examples, the super type. In this case, it's a class. It's a class. And then we're gonna have a bunch of subclasses would be subtypes of this of this superclass fine timer modular timer possible timer resettable timer and the question is are these legitimate subtypes in the same sense that i asked you last time is fred x a legitimate franchise of that or is it instead wrong Right? Okay, so fine timer. Fine timer takes the basic course timer interface and it extends it with an extra useful method that re reports the cumulative number of seconds that have elapsed since the object was created. That that complements the minutes up here, which returns the total elapsed minute count since the object was created in the course timer in the super type. So fine timer takes that and it adds a nice little utility method for seconds. Is that a legitimate subtype of the super type? Uh, yes, Marmar. I think so because one, we're not overriding the previous method. And here the functionality that we have um, is the same as the course timer, it just has been less than a minute or hours. Yeah, yeah, there's no problem here. It doesn't in any way change the behavior of that. It doesn't change the behavior of a fine timer in some way that someone would find surprising. Someone is treating a fine timer as if it were a course timer, won't be surprised at all. All they'll know is they can call that. So they won't even know about the fact. If they're treating it as a, a course timer. Um, if they passed it to someone else in the code base who secretly knew it was a fine timer, that person could call seconds, but it, it won't affect what, what this person is just dealing with it as if it's a course timer. So, no problem though. That's perfectly legitimate. Perfectly legitimate. Okay, how about modulo time? This one's basically takes, takes the, the interface provided by course server, doesn't add any extra methods, but all it does is override minutes to do something it thinks is kind of more useful, which is basically, instead of giving the cumulative number of minutes in total since it was created, it gives the number of minutes within the final hour of time um, since, since this was created. So, so maybe, you know, it's it's uh, uh, fifty hours and fifteen minutes, and so it will return fifty. Whereas this one would have re re returned fifty times sixty. That's three hundred plus fifty. Right? I'm sorry, three thousand plus fifty. Right? Okay. So, so is modular timer a legitimate subtype of course timer or not? Um, Alex, did you agree now? Oh, oh, uh -huh. no. Right, right. And so, and, and I want to be clear here. It's just a tough thing with thinking that some of your code might have come up as a confusion. If someone were dealing with a something that's secretly a modular timer, but all they know is that it's a course timer, it's passed into them as if it's a course timer. Secretly, it's one of these modular timers. It's passed in 
the difference the quarter circle. All they know is the two quarter circle. And they call minutes. Which minutes will be called? Uh, it's been secretly a modular timer, but they think it's just that thing is known as the quarter circle. Which minutes will be called? The subtype minutes will be called. It's the actual type, not the apparent type, that determines what's called. So could someone be surprised if they think it's this? And it's been 50 hours and 15 minutes, and they call minutes, and they get back 15. Could they be surprised? They could say, what the heck? This is this is a course term. This is a fraud, right? Um, they could be rudely, rudely surprised. Fair enough. Amongst other things, the heading is different value. It violates uh, a history property. Something that you compare its value at time x, another value at time y. You expect a certain relationship that's not true. What is this? What is this violating? Uh, if, if we're dealing with course timer, minutes should never what uh, g. I think it's like it is violent as opposed to true. It's it's violent, you're actually right. But there's a history problem. Remember, I said it has to stay true to the behavior expected for this this method. That's what you're referring to. But it also has to observe what I call invariance. Things that are true at any one time that you're counting on, like this vertical zero or something like that, which is not an issue here. But the other thing is history problems, things that you compare to value with time one and time two. There may be certain things, structural things that are guaranteed for course numbers, not up here. That's not the case for modular time. What can modular time do that's impossible with course time? Course time or uh, tomorrow? Not a modular time, it's a time to be uh, yeah. uh, what it was before, but it's not possible. Right. Right, exactly. For course timer, this value can only I mean it can stay the same if you call it quick enough, right? Um, like immediately after, or it can go up, right? But it should never go down, right? At least before the universe collapsed, right? Um uh, uh, and you know the number of minutes exceeds two to sixty-four. Yeah, um, well uh math. Oh uh, the uh, just want to go, so in the first example, we're adding it in the necessity of the method by anything the left to it. In the second one, so we are calling a method that is being called in the super class. So, for the, for the second, for modular class. Yeah. yeah. So, what can we do with minutes that is modified by, but we won't be, we won't be, we can make this more efficient. You could compute it with a cleverer algorithm, right? Um, but it has to adhere to this interface, this contract. This is counting on it. Just as much as someone might look at the FedEx website, I mean, counting on you accepting package, silver display as well. And you have to adhere to that. But it could implement a concentration, right? It could, it could have a particularly Clever algorithm for it. Um, it it might, you know, additionally, for example, when it calls it, it might maybe it computes the elapsed times and it maybe it will you know, make it really quick to call it again, quick succession, and it'll give it two extra quick to get a frequency fix. But you can't change the behavior like what it means, like what value. It's going to be returning, or else someone appears to be surprised. That's not a, that's, you know, it's doing something totally different, right? So, if this gave a random number, for example, someone could be pretty upset, right? They're like, this is something totally different. So, this has to live within this contract. Just like Fred has to live within the FedEx rule of thumb. Yes, please. And you never get the um, order of the time or the super process. Well, you certainly could. How would you do much of the time? How would you, how would you 
Just don't call it minutes, right? Don't have to write minutes. You could call it, you know, minutes in the last hour or, you know, um, or module events or whatever, right? You, you, you could have, just don't override it. Don't, don't swing around with this thing for like minutes, right? Like, like, don't try cutting it out from under this, right? Um, just like you could, yeah. Um, so you could offer, you could offer as, um, as Fred asked, a special deal, you know, if you get it to me by 10 a.m., I can get it to the destination even faster. But you have to observe the FedEx guarantee that you can still get it there for five minutes. That's what you're looking for. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when you say just don't want to buy it, like, do you even need like to just buy it? Like, let's start with like, this to be like even smaller. So, for example, um, if we if we pull it, but this minute could basically take the output of minutes in the super type and um, like uh, maybe, uh, maybe it's long subtracting so minutes. Just like, for example, this branch guy is a 10 minute faster than that. Does that still violate because it's only 10 minutes left for that long? Well, it's just a totally last minute. So someone might be helping on that, you know, pretty carefully for what it is, right? And they may be really surprised to get an end of that. You were asking me, like, what else could this do? Well, I'll tell you one thing that it could do. It's a perfectly legitimate thing. So it makes it more efficient. Then it's here could log the message. It could implement it and log it, right? It could log it out, right? Or it could it could go and um, save it to a database that, that we call it or something like that, in addition to them recording returning to the value there. It can add bells and whistles to it, but it just can't change this behavior that's promised. It's promised. Someone may be counting on it. And all they know is this record time around the Uh, gee, yeah. You cannot change the post condition. Yeah. I mean, you have to, well, here, you have to live within the post condition. You have to give a post condition that is, is, is technically with, within that, right? And, um, in this case, it's kind of hard to imagine a post condition that wouldn't be exactly the same. Yeah. Um, this post condition could be like, like if you run the post condition loosely, that, you know, plus or minus five minutes, you could have this thing do something that's a little bit different, but still within that post condition, right? It could sharpen it. They can talk about it. Yeah, so, um, well, is that a very historic contribution? Oh, uh, yeah, history, uh, history problem. Yes, exactly. So, so we have the method behavior, which are uh, the behavior of a particular method. And then we have something called the invariant, which is something about the whole class in the statistics. It's, that it's like um, the value, the value return or can be about the whole class, but it's, it may be something like this never holds a, this, the table here never holds a null, um, you know, a null uh, a key, for example, or never has an empty lookup value in it or what have you. Um, it might also be that, you know, it might be a guarantee that it never returns a negative value or something. Counter never, never is a negative value. That, that's a property the whole thing, one time. And then there's something called history property. And these are this is in the slides here, and I'll, I'll post them if I haven't already. History properties would basically you're comparing something at T1 and T2. Sort of you compare the value at two different times, and you may notice a property. For example, the value at a later time is always greater than or equal to the value that it has an illusion. Now, if you become something you're coming in an illusion, you're coming on it never required. I don't know if that's all. Yeah, okay. So let's talk about possible time. So here, pretty nifty. You know, it's, it's like, of course, Connor could be possible. 
Could someone be surprised if secretly they're given a possible time or thinking of just a course time? Could they be surprised by this? What about Well, sir. Sir. Uh, I'm not uh, looking at it. Yes. I don't know what we're saying. Yeah. Uh, so I saw thinking it's illegitimate. Um, <laughs> That's, so it's illegitimate because what well, they they'd be surprised um if the spider suddenly stopped um in the original method yeah. you know, then then time time should keep going forever. Yeah, and moreover it would violate this, right? This is like totally last minute since the object was created. And now suddenly here you can like stop it. And so somewhere else in the company it said no, it's just like the person who thinks it's just a poor time is not gonna know. But if they pass this object to somewhere else in the code base, and it it knows it's possible, it causes pause for three days, and then it gives it, and then you know, and, and then it does resume or whatever, and, and or it just leaves it pause. This person, all they know is for some of the same. Like, ah, it might be stronger than this, right? And, you know, the minutes aren't going up, right? And then it's sort of like. Frozen. This is a course timer. This is a problem, right? Yeah. Um. Okay. So this is this is not a legitimate behavioral subject. It's nifty, but it's dangerous, and it could break someone. Someone's code is just counting on being course timer. They wrote the code back when there were only course timers. They didn't know that anyone would someday introduce a possible timer. Their code is just coming on, on it working just as a plain Jane sort of interface as given to you. Healthy mommy problem. And they said, there's no way it could just pause. That's in violation of this understanding, this contract. You're in violation of the contract. Right? Yes, you're in the Yeah, it violates what this, you know, and basically minutes now by implication is not going to give the correct value. Right? Um, now, you actually expect it to, to override minutes as well. It's kind of, it's kind of by the policy. So, yeah, it would, it would no longer, it will make this no longer correct. Right? Um, how about resettable time? Yeah. Well, yeah, but we said well, Connor goes beyond it in general principle, but now it violates history problem, right? Because this can go what? Down. Down. Can this one go down possible time? No. It can't go down. It just belies the system. Yeah. But that also violates the history property because with the original, we're expecting a later time. To yeah, yeah, I think that's a I, I think it's violates. You're right about that. It's another form of the history property. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that is that is a jerk. Yeah, should go up over time. I mean, it also violates the code given. It no longer is is actually recording it. Um, or returning. The total last minute. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So that's uh, that's good. Let's let's go look at another one here. Here's my read-only dictionary. My read-only dictionary basically uh, takes in some keys and some corresponding elements, and basically they have to be the same size, and and basically it's going to represent a map from keys, which are strings, to elements, which are doubles. So it's going to give it a name, so it's going to return 3.14159, give it a name, you know, 371, it's going to return horror or something like that, right? Oh, I'm sorry, no, that's not a double. It's going to return <laughs> minus infinity, something like that, right? Um, okay. Um, and and then there's a get element, which basically is going to look, uh, look things up uh, and and it returns this so that uh, it's uh, an element of B. Note that it has to 
Um, so P needs to be on the bench card. That's part of the reason. And assuming it is, it will return the the double associated with that. And then is occupied with that. Is it in there? Right? Is is a given string? In there? Is three seven one? Okay. Well, that's a nice for class. Um, I don't know if you want to do it. Class, um, and you can, um, do 21 of the nice big class, maybe, or horrible big class. Anyway, okay, my read on my read search dictionary. This attempts to be a subtype of this one, um, but it offers some neat functionality. It, it lets you insert elements in there. Is this? A legitimate subtype. Could someone have just known that they have a means to me by reading on the dictionary? Secretly have unbeknownst to us, their past of my read and search dictionary. Could they be rudely surprised? Yes, Mom. Uh, I don't I think it's a legitimate. I would say when it's illegitimate, yeah. because they wouldn't expect new values to be there, especially if they know all the values that exist. They would be surprising to find it new values. Yeah, so maybe they have some interested algorithm. It asks up front, is this thing in the dictionary? No, it's not. They generate a random print. They say, is this in the dictionary? No. And now they're counting on that in some way that this is not in the dictionary. And then in the process, they're passing what they only know to be a bit like read on the dictionary somewhere else. And that other person knows it's one of these and sticks this, this extra key in there. Which is happens to be the same value. And now the original code breaks because they're counting on it not having this thing in it. It's checked that it wasn't in it, and now suddenly it is in it. And their code, you know, didn't it was clever, it didn't do some checks, and then because of this, and now their code breaks because the logic is, is off. So this could break code that is. Accepting things that are my read on it. So this insert element is a dangerous thing. Now, you might think this is wow, this is really a constrained thing. Is there something you could do in my read only dictionary that would leave open the possibility of subtypes like this? Yes, well, hi. This is not created in another dictionary, but uh, uh, does anyone want to add it? I mean, yeah, you could. You could. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah. What's the other thing you could do? It's perfectly a good thing. Yeah, you could put an insert function in here and dissipate it. So, kind of nice. One of the ideas of object oriented programming is you want to be able to add, extend things over time. So it's kind of nice to have this ability to extend this later, right? Without it to change the code. But if you're parsing it enough, you can actually change the key. Yeah. Sorry? I changed it. Um, well, yeah, I mean, but you might then break code that's using this in your library, right? Um, but there could be code that's using it. The basic deal is double hard. Could you replace the element with spec or something or string like four, right? Well, right, okay, good question. Like right now, there doesn't seem to be a way that that could happen, right? Someone could be counting reasonably. Look at this interface. So, wait a minute. Okay, it's the read on the first of all. I give it the element. There's no way to update the element. If I can guess that my command key is occupied, so they might count them and not change. But here's the thing. This is all about, you know, uh, setting expectations. And, and the, the thing is, like right now, someone could have expectations. You could put a comment in, say, hey, don't count on, you know, these things always remain the same. We want to, we want to be able to anticipate they may change in the future. Don't count on the thing read only by the name. You know, um, uh, this could evolve. Um, buyer beware, you know, um, in the future, this may be extended in ways that would allow things to be inserted or things to be changed. They can put a 
comma there, right? And, and that's the fair one, right? So if someone had one of these, they say, oh, okay. Um, there could be version, you know, subtypes in this around that will change these. That is fair game, right? Um, if just without that, someone could stare at this interface all day and say it's, it's impossible that you will get something that will, you know, with this interface, with this contract, it's impossible that it will be changed. But just like contracts in law and so on, you can give fair warning, say, you know, you must indemnify a whole harmless thing or whatever you're part of this contract, and basically it's a copy of that book. Yeah. So we'll help. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, but remember that, yeah, it's a good idea. But if my read only dictionary was the subtype of my read and search dictionary, then somebody else, knowing this of my read and search dictionary, not knowing secretly my read only, might insert something in it, and suddenly your claim, your boss's claim to have a read only one. Is is like you know it it is violated, so it's it's a problem. Okay, G, yeah. Sorry. You you cannot do read write operation. Yeah. So in general, this is part of history property, right? If it's invariant, sorry, if it if it doesn't change over time. If it doesn't change over time, it's by the super type. It's, you know, uh, someone could be counting on that. And then if a subtype does start changing it over time, the person who just thinks it's an instance of the super type can be really surprised, right? So, so you got to be really careful. Um, the yeah. Um, yeah. If, uh, but if you would still Sorry. Sorry, this But if you would insert it in one, you would substitute the snapshot of the original dictionary. So when so so you do not violate the worst condition of the Well, but someone could have checked earlier the string minaf is not in this dictionary. And and they could be counting because in this class, if that's true once, it will be true for all time hence, right? Mm -hmm. They could be counting on that from then on and never reach out yet. Whereas if it can be inserted in it, you know, that might throw them off later because they're counting on it still being true. Because with this interface, if it's true once, it will always be. Right. Um, okay. Um, okay. So let's let's. I, I'm getting the sense that you're still exploring this idea. So I wanna, I wanna um, give you some more examples. So I think we go on to some. Other material, but I'm getting a good dialogue here. So let's give you these some examples. Very likely, it's going to be the last one. It was amazing. Oh, you get one. Great. Right. Uh, so, okay, an integer bag and an integer stack. Okay, so suppose that we have an integer bag. Does anyone know what a bag is or a stack? I mean, I'm talking to some data. Uh, yeah, all right. Like that. Except that it allows more than one instance. So, bag or sack allows, you might, so a set would say, like, do you or do you not have one in it? Um, a, a bag might have three ones, you know, four twos, zero threes, and, and 14 fours. You know, something like that, right? Um, that's a bag. So suppose we have an integer bag. Um, we can insert things in it. 
We can remove things from it. Sounds pretty good. We can check if it has things in it. And we can ask for its size. So with an integer bag, I might, might start at And then I insert seven. And if I call has from seven, I'll get back what? Sure. Then I can call remove on seven. And then I can call has on seven again, and I'll get back what? Good. Yeah. But the difference is, you know, I could insert, let's say, three twice, right? I could, I could insert one, the and it has. I can insert it twice, the and it. And then I could remove it once, and I'll still be on that one time. Okay, now let's suppose someone said that's an empty class. I want to create a, a subclass. The integer for stack. And this gives me a great starting point. So I'm going to now make it a, a genuine set. So it's either in there zero time or one time. That's it. Either in there or not. Okay, so I'm going to have a precondition on insert that it's not in there. Right? Here's here's insert, and now I've added the precondition that it can't be in there. And the post condition is now it's just like it would be there. Yeah. Um remove the post condition is not half, meaning by the way, you can be aware of like in in um the specification you can use terms. This has, that's just a call to have, right? Um, yeah, uh, so remove, after we remove it, it's not in there, right? Because there's only zero or one. We can iterate through it and we can ask if one thing is accepted. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. But the question is, is that a legitimate subtype at this point? Could someone think it's one of these, these integer bags, and secretly in an set, could they be rudely surprised? Yes, Mark. I don't think it's legitimate because someone in the pairing class where the super type might add a value and it's not actually added because it's good. Good, yeah. You just say it's good. Someone could <laughs> insert three one time. <laughs> and then they could insert three one time. Right? Um and they could call thinking so so they could do that yeah um and and uh they could do it again right and they could remove it right uh and that could lead to that it would still remain in there right if they were to do that with an integer set here you know, uh, so so all they know is it in your bag, and, and they know if they do this twice and remove it, it can still have it in there. If it's secretly an integer set, pass to them. They think it's an integer bag, then it's secretly an integer set. If they do that, what will happen? They add it twice and then remove it. Should it be in there? First of all, it's blow up, or I think they just put it twice, it'll blow up. It's not allowed to be in there. And so they can be really surprised, right? They think it's an integer bag, and they say, well, what's the matter with adding it twice? That's all the point of an integer bag, right? Um, but an integer set says, no, you're not allowed to insert it twice. And that could blow their code up, right? There's integer bag is like an empty base of which to, to build it, but you can't just create a subclass because it's convenient to extend the superclass to reuse its implementation because it can lead to this behavior, which is illegitimate. So someone's code, thinking it's an integer bag, blows up. They they call and insert twice on it, and they say, What's that? There's no point of that. It's an integer more than one. But secretly, it's an integer set. They didn't even know that an integer set you know, existed when they wrote their code. So this is not a legitimate sub subtype. Do you see that, Manette? Yeah. Um, so everything is different. I can't help but grab the property owner. 
insert and remove these subtypes, but I don't think we move out anything in the super type. It's just the insert child great most of the Correct. Right. Correct. Right? Correct. Yeah. Although oh there there is the issue that um okay if we look beyond the fact that insert doesn't allow duplicates to be inserted. We were to put that up. It's still broken uh, because someone can insert twice and then remove. They insert three, insert three, so remove three. And it will it'll remain. One of those three will still be in there. But here, if it's this removed, that's being called because it's again the actual type, not the apparent type, the code is being called. Calling remove here requires that um, that that it uh, not be there. So um, yeah, so so that after it finishes, when you call remove, it needs to be gone from there, and this is going to blow up. Needs to be still there. Sorry. Yeah, I think I agree with you. But yeah, the post condition is not met. The post condition because why don't these means are still that's right. Um, by the way, size would also affect people, right? Because if if um, all they know is this integer value, the best thing is secretly when you insert it twice, if it's not bothering to insert it the second time, because it's already here, come come from if that were the case, then size would also be off. We would say size one and then plus two. Yeah, was there a question here? Any? So, um, so action, 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 action. They cannot, so here's the thing. They can change preconditions and postconditions in a certain way, in a way that's safe. And and we we talked about it earlier, but um it may not have, have come across here. Um so uh, by the way, this is this common in history properties and subvariants. So it's this whole principle of methods of subtypes must behave consistently with those of, of supertypes. So here, they can weaken the preconditions. This is just like Fred X being able to weaken when you have to get the package result, right? Um, they could allow you to bring it in by, by 1 p.m., yeah, not this new. But they have to at least handle all the cases that FedEx is part. They have to be able to deliver your package if you bring the bike in. But maybe they, because they have Santa's sled and the reindeer bit stuff, they can deliver it even if you deliver it to them by 3 p.m. They can still get it to the destination by tomorrow by p.m. Yeah, that's fine. They can weaken it, right? What I'm saying is the, the subtype method can weaken the precondition. It can strengthen, it can add a more restrictive precondition, like that it not be in there. And they can strengthen or maintain the post condition. So it has to be a legal post condition for the super That's whatever they do, they have to live within the guarantee. So so maybe you at Fred S can deliver it by on the next day. That's fine. Within the constraints allowed by, by FedEx. FedEx says yeah, it gets delivered by 5 p.m. Um, and you deliver by 3 p.m. That's fine. It's within that, but you're providing an even stronger guarantee. Do you see what I mean? You're providing a stronger a, 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 you know, a, a, a post condition that is legal. For the for the broader ones, but but make you more specific guarantee, stronger guarantee. That's a lot. Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. So this is is covered here, and I, I I do note this one about invariance. So these are things that are true at any given time, such as it always is greater than zero, for example, like with a counter, right? Um, this counter here uh, is always zero or more. Remember that from last time? Whereas, for example, 
uh, this one, it's not true. Like this one can initialize it to a negative value or this one, um, well, yeah. So it's it's always, this could make it negative. Um, okay. Um, maybe, maybe we'll go through uh, a few more, um, few more examples. I think I did some of these last time. Oh, okay, here. Oh yes, dual counter. I'll take a look at that. So the dual counter um, takes counter, but it actually has two counters, which is kind of cool. It has one you call get, and the other you call get two. Mm. One you call increment, the other you call increment true. Okay. So is dual counter a legitimate subtype of counter? It extends counter, and it does it by adding another counter. So it has two counters. Mm -hmm. But if if you pass around as a counter, all you know about is the first. Is that legit? Is that legit? Yes, it's legit. It's perfectly legit. Great. You don't have to get a disappointment at all. Just if you have this extra counter, you can get around this and it doesn't hurt it at all in terms of its guarantees of the, the main interface. You appreciate that? Okay. How about swappable dual counter? Now I can swap them. I can I can take the first and switch it to the second one. Any illegitimate? Yeah. Why is that? Exactly. Yeah. They're expecting to get the first one. Second one is going to swap for it. And now the counter could what? Could go down, right? Maybe the first counter was at 512. The second counter was at two. We swap them, right? And so someone says, what the heck? It went way down, right? So it's possible dual counter to be bad. How many bad is it? Yes, for now. Um, like, obviously, I agree. But it's correct, but it's just that it's wrong with the right idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, like, the fact that the injunction bit is called smart, if I'm not expecting it to be smart, I should question it. Well, but well, obviously, that's still like, you know, according to you, like I said, I, I think I agree is swap does break an illegitimate subtitle. Well, but I, I think that's a key point. Don't need to be out the side. Remember, the whole point is to reason safely about, about subtypes in the presence of subtypes. So the deal is, if someone saw the name, they would know it's a book. But here, the point is, someone may think they're dealing with a dual comment. They wrote their code long before swappable <laughs> All they think, their code, is cast in what's called the dual counter. And they're calling on it these various things. Nobody told them that someday the net will write a swappable dual counter. They don't know that that ever will exist. It's not yet expected in the context of So all they know is it's the dual counter. They don't see any swappable name. All they see is the dual counter. And they're calling. You know, and, and implement on it. And they're expecting, based on the fact that it's, it's uh, remember, this one extends dual counter, and dual counter extends counter. They said counter, they expect this to never go down. It can only stay the same or go up. And that's true for all theirs, and all that's happy until suddenly the thing that's passed into them secretly is the swap of dual counter. The person operating with the dual counter doesn't know it. But somewhere else in the code base, there's something that knows it's a swappable a dual counter and, and calls this swap counter value. Okay. And, and it's the same instance of it that this person's dealing with. They just think that they're terrified, the dual counter. And it's been changed out from under. They don't know it's a swappable dual counter. They never see that name. This code was written. Before, what's that? That sounds like a big story. 
<laughs> yes, um, fair enough. Um, so, okay, so I guess I got to make it more likely then. Um, okay, uh, yeah, so, um, here we go. Okay, yeah, I think we, um, okay, so some key points for reflection. Interface representations are complex. The promise is. Uh, who relies on these? Well, users of instances of the class. So, so here, like um, someone who uses a mind read only dictionary is counting on this interface. They're counting on this being true. They're counting on this contract that it's read only because they don't see any way it could not be read only. Again, if it had a comment here, if it said buyer beware, this class may be extended and you know in many ways, you know, don't come from being read only. That's fine. Then fair one. It's a contract. But absent that, they could be counting on it. Users of my read-only dictionary. But the other person who's counting on this is creators of interfaces. Um, people who stop talking. And, and that sometimes has to be a major with the title of the super class. Okay? Um, and it turns out super class creators uh, also have to be aware of this. They have to rely on certain overridden subclass methods. We're going to get to that next during the tutorial from this issue of subclass uh, of, of subclass treatment and this override. Okay? Not providing clear specification. Like if, if you don't provide any sort of specification, it doesn't get you, it doesn't help you here. It in fact leads people to jump to conclusions. One of the best things you can do is provide some guidance about what the guarantee is. Otherwise, people will come to conclusions that might not be safe. Like this thing is read only or what have you. Um uh, and when you're reasoning about a subtype type interface here, and I don't know why this, you're purely worrying about the interface itself, not its implementation. We're reasoning here about consistency in promises, ladies and gentlemen, not consistency in implementation. The next lecture uh, in, in 20 minutes will be about consistency in implementation, okay? So, uh, so let's go substitution principle. Let us reason about how we can make promises that are that are consistent in the subtypes that are consistent with those in the supertype. So we don't break code that thinks it's an instance of the supertype and it's actually an instance of the subtype. Okay. Maybe we'll do one more. One minute. A couple minutes. So we don't set. So this is the super fun. If you pass in an integer array, a set of elements, and then you can ask, is so it's an integer array, so it's a this is an int set, it is the name. And you can ask, is in for a given integer? Is that in the set, right? Set. Um, and you can iterate through its elements. What's not the law? Okay, here's now I have a derived, I have something that tends to be a derived in set, and it says that it tends to read only in set. Um, and it provides a size method. All it does is it returns whether or what its size is. How many things are right? Is that a legitimate subtype? Yes, yeah. uh, it is. No harm done. No fault, right? This, this is perfectly fine. Just because this has size, it doesn't interfere at all. It's not overriding, it's not adding both the preconditions that are incompatible. Right? It's not screwing it up in, in some sort of way by allowing it to be modified over time in a way the parent was. It, it doesn't allow it to decline when someone's counting on it, always going off for staying the same, right? So no problem there. Okay, how about this one? Arrive in set two. Now we can insert. Yes, go ahead. 
Yeah, so this is not a correct sense. Well, it's not just because it's a reason. It, it's a sense from a read only sense, but also the reason is to match up this uh, insert and insert uh, mm. on uh, for a null value, whereas in the read only set it's you know, for null value. Uh, yeah, the element. Well, this is saying the array can't be null. Yeah, but this is actually saying so. This says no precondition on this. Uh, we're counting on it being an integer because in Java it will enforce the correct right. typing that it's an integer, and um, and then it updates it. But the fact is, if we provide this, we could break the code of someone who thinks once I've checked it's in, it's not as in it. If not in it, it will never be. Okay, yes, well, done. So, um, and I'm going to tell you about this. Um, the only example seems like other than this, that they could we just have both of these and some type of other common? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Or, yeah, so you have a uh, just a more generic inset. And and it doesn't provide anything to modify it. This one is a read-only version of that. It doesn't modify it, but but the super type would have to guarantee, like you would have to convey, like if it doesn't provide an insert um, or something to modify it, you don't want someone for the super type, the new super type, to come away with the impression it has to be real. And so, like, okay, if you're saying make these subtypes or something else, you yeah. don't want that third thing, the third piece about subtype stuff, to be something that someone is counting on to be real, right? Right. So, super type wouldn't have like a certain method at all. It would only have the common method, like is in, yep. uh, for example, right? Or would have the Right. So, my point is, like, unless you're careful, someone looking at that, those methods would say, I don't see any insert, I don't see any. Delete. I don't see any change, so it must be real. So, like, someone would again, they can put a comment, right? They can, they can put a comment there saying, you know, um, this is a generic, generic sort of implementation, um, uh, no properties other than those stated in these comments could be assumed. Like, you can give people a fair warning and say, you know, no. We're not providing any guarantees express or imply by that, right? Like, do not come away with implications. Do not draw implications to read only, or do not draw implications other than what's explicitly stated. I like, we'll have abstract classes yes. um, as a parent, right? And then whoever's reading it, as well as an abstract class, so you have to go and see, okay, there, there has to be a contrary. Somewhere. So you can get a list of all kinds of things. Um, yeah, but those can change over time. People grab, right? Okay. After you write your code, someone could add 15 of them. Okay, that's the thing. So here's the thing with, with code. I mean, um, and this is important to keep in mind in the stage of open source, where just because you can go look at the code as it is now, or get a list as it is now, doesn't mean it will stay that way, right? Like you may write your code now and it may evolve and while your code is shifting and being used, like there may be other things added to the library and so on that you don't know about now. And you want to be careful that those new things that are added are not gonna break your code sometimes, right? Um they're not going to leave your code to to break because of, of new subtypes. Um, so uh, it's the same thing with testing. Like if you, um, you know, just just because we test it with all existing subtypes doesn't mean that all future subtypes it will it will also remain um, remain solid for us. Code evolves. We have to be. We have to be careful. Um, yes, Manette. Um, I just want to ask about the, the positive and negative. Yeah. Yeah. For example, in this one, 
imagine people might be doing read only. Mm -hmm. And if I would have to leave, but scale my project, then I want to extend this time. I want to do a method that uses the generate yeah, function, yeah, method, which is already written in the side. Yeah, but I do want to be more part of this. So to me, the benefits is that I'm inverting the super class, but I'm doing like maybe adding one or two one of the right. saving a lot of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But obviously, you, according to the concept, this file. Well, so, okay, so yeah. yeah, so when we talk about this, this is the next uh, tutorial here. Um, so the deal is that a lot of people, developers, are tempted to use. So classing to achieve reuse of code, right? And that's one of the things that's talked about, right? You reuse the implementation, you extend it, right? Even the very word suggests that you're inheriting the implementation and you tweak it, right? What's not the lesson? The problem is that when that comes along with some typing guarantees, there can be challenges because what you really want to do, what you're saying is, it's a little bit like, like uh, this case. I want to, I want to use this, and just tweak it. Um, but someone could be counting on these these features. Similarly here, right? I want to be able to use this, and I want to be able to add some extra flexibility, like modifying it. Um, but then it can break the subtyping. So, what modern languages uh, are often providing? Is a way of separating subtyping from subclass. And so subtyping as it relates to the whole market. Like I can pass around a subtype as if it's an instance of a superclass. Subclassing here brings subtyping to Java with it, but it also brings reuse of implementation. And there's methods like mixin. I don't know if you've heard about mixin so, or traits and scholar. You take a three four you. Can you talk about traits? Maybe a little bit. So these are mechanisms to allow you to reuse implementation without applying some type. So I can use this implementation without it to it. I can reuse it and put it like in my own contract. And I don't have to worry that I can live within it. It's just that in languages where they come together, where it's up class, I get all this goodies for the implementation, but then I can pass it around as if it is an instance of the superclass. That gets risky. But by separating the two with mixins and with traits and other similar technologies. You can have a neat separation, reuse implementation without implying that I can pass around as if it is an instance of super type to someone who doesn't know any that it's not, um, but that it doesn't adhere to the same behavior, or I can get some typing without any use of implementation. Okay, and, and that's the way study languages tend to be going. There's others that just don't use subclassing, they only use subtype. And some some languages are that type. Okay, so um I think we're gonna stop this lecture right now and we're gonna transition to our tutorial with a bit of a health break in between. And I will see you over in that room because this room is occupied. Okay. So we'll go over to whatever whatever it is, but we've been there many times before, right? Okay, great questions and glad to 